Good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us, our M Plus Design Trust Research Fellowship Public Talk tonight. Uh, the talk titled uh, China and the Cosmo Technique of Fashion by Anuchka Bandriel. And then also this uh, so the Zoom webinar. So if you we have uh, the Chinese and the Cantonese simultaneous translation. So if you'd like to switch your language, you can see bottom of your, your screen, I think you can click there. And it's also we are streaming with the really, really to reach the very wide audience for this very exciting topic. So my name is Iko Yokoyama. I'm lead curator of design architecture at the M Plus. So M Plus is a new museum visual culture situated in West Kowloon Culture District in Hong Kong. We are dedicated to collecting, exhibiting, and interpreting uh, inter interpreting visual culture 20th, 21st century through the lenses of visual art, design architecture, and moving images. Our aim is to be a new kind of museum that reflect our unique time and place, a museum that built on Hong Kong's historic balance of the local and the international to define a distinctive and innovative uh, voice for ages 21st century. The M plus we open uh, in last uh, November, but unfortunately we are temporarily closed due to the COVID measures, but we'll be very much looking forward to reopen uh, and welcome you very soon. So before I'm introducing uh, the speaker today, uh, I would like to express my sincere uh, thanks to Design Trust for their continued support in M plus Design Trust Research Fellowship Program. We started our collaboration in 2015. So in past seven years, we have supported 12 research projects investigating issues relating to design architecture in Hong Kong, Greater Bay Area and Asia. But not only expanding the bodies of knowledge in these areas, the research also informs uh, M plus collection strategies, but it's also public programs. So today, on behalf of Marisa Yu, uh, co-founder and executive director of Design Trust, who cannot be here right now, but she will be joining us audience very soon. I briefly introduced the grant funding and a, a community platform Design Trust. So Design Trust was established in 2014 by Hong Kong Ambassadors of Design, a registered charity in Hong Kong since 2007. Design Trust support and fund innovative and thought provoking projects the visionary internationally and developed expertise, uh, built the research initiatives and the content related to Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area. We related the educational programs and also encourage advanced uh, design competency for benefit for, of the public. And then also, uh, I'm very pleased to present our speaker of this evening and our research fellow 2021, Anuchka Bandriel and very excited to and hear her research findings very soon. So Anuchka is a curator, researcher, innovation lead based in Beijing, and she has been active in China's creative sector over a decade, and collaborating with culture organizations on the curatorial projects. Also, Anuchka runs the People's Work, a platform for social innovation as a part of Architecture Studio People's Architecture Office. Her research and the curatorial project focus on the social effects and the implication of design across a uh, disciplinary spectrum. Her recent exhibition include uh, social design, learning at the play in 19 and 20. And also uh, you might have seen it, uh, the, the regenerative design exhibition, disruptive uh, matter in 2020 was at the K-11 in Hong Kong and also Shen, uh, Shen Yang. And then also, so now uh, I'm very uh, would like to thanks and they introduce our distinguished panel discussant for today's topic, Shawai uh, Ye. Shawai uh, is one of China's key opinion leaders on fashion and culture. She's currently group style editorial director of Modern Media and the founder of Ye Ye Ye. Then an independent consultancy focused on fashion and sustainability. Shawai has played a pivotal role in Chinese fashion industry since early 2000s. As a former editor and, uh, sorry, as a former chief editor and editorial director of Modern Weekly, she made the progressive development of the publication and it became one of the most influential lifestyle publications in China since. Uh, prior to joining uh, Modern Weekly, she worked as a fashion director of GQ Taiwan 
and also co-founded independent style magazine Allude in New York. She was also involved in the present, uh, preparation of the launch of the Vogue China. And this panel discussion will be moderated by Tanya Kunz, uh, Associate Curator of Design Architecture at Templas, and Noel Chung, Assistant Curator of Design Architecture at Templas, will be addressing Q&A session. And also, uh, I would like to thank Noel for running uh, this Templas Design Trust Fellowship program for past few years, and then Christine Lee, Curatorial Assistant, for supporting organizing tonight's event together with the Design Trust team. Before I uh, hand over mic to uh, Nuchka, I would like to remind uh, all of you uh, to address, please feel free to address your questions in the chat box and it will be addressed uh, after, after the discussions. So without a further ado, I would like to welcome Anuchka. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Iko. Uh, thank you also, Marissa, Tanya, Noel, and the whole M Plus and Design Trust team. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining today. I just wanted to start off uh, by talking about my original thinking regarding this fellowship. Uh, the motivation for this research project for me uh, started um, several years ago in that it really felt independent fashion in China was maturing and there was a lot of attention and buzz, but not a lot of focused and critical reflection on what was happening and had been happening. Uh, I come at this topic from the position of a curator active in the field of design in China across a variety of disciplines and build on observations of change over the 15 plus years that I've lived in Beijing. That said, I think I still underestimated the complexity of my topic and the difficulty in taking on an industry-wide perspective. Um, so I'll remark that what I'll present today uh, is really very much a, note, a kind of notes in progress. Um, then also a quick remark on the presentation document itself. Uh, I just want to clarify that at times the images illustrate more directly certain points that I make and at times uh, they are more part of the background story. And so I'll start to share my screen. There you go. Uh, my research focuses on the developments in China's fashion sector in relation and in parallel to how technology is developing within China, taking as its title China and the Cosmotechnics of Fashion. While the title aims to capture the essence of the research, it also complicates things in both its use of terminology and its scope. Nonetheless, I, early on, I deliberately chose to run with it and will here elaborate a little bit on the concepts contained. First, I would like to briefly expand on the concept of cosmotechnics and how it is useful within the context of inquiry. Secondly, in order to understand the developments taking place in China's fashion industry today, a brief background sketch is needed as the path of development has been largely different to to the known historical canon of fashion. Thirdly, essentially the question that the research aims to frame a response to is that China is currently positioned as a front runner driving the future of technology with, high, with a highly adoptive and mostly techno-optimistic populace. What does this mean for the fashion sector, uh, specifically for developments in the design and dissemination of fashion and what can we, le what can we learn? Returning to cosmotechnics, cosmotechnics is a term coined by Hong Kong philosopher Ye Kui. Hui defines the term as follows, the unification of the cosmic order and moral order through technical activities, whether craft making or art making. The term seeks to create an alternative, alternate philosophy of technology from a more Chinese perspective, differing from the historical Western perspective. In this alternative framework, which looks back into history, technology is the link between the cosmic order and the moral order of our world. Yet we face a dilemma in current times having lost our cosmic dimension in the way it was intended. In his 2016 book, Hui contests the Western European universal view of technology by arguing for a techno-diversity grounded in the cultural practices that make any technical system possible in the first place. In today's world, one could argue that China has cut, caught up to the great world powers, but at the same time, the country is not yet able to deal with a new scenario in terms of philosophy or thinking. China is on the same technological time axis as the West, Hui observes, but what still lags behind is Chinese thought, i.e. a way of thinking about technology rooted in Chinese culture. Hui posits that something went wrong in the separation of tradition and modern life and asks how Ch Chinese philosophy could think technology and how such an intellectual endeavor is inevitably linked to Western thought. The premise is not to dwell on the Needham question, but to look at a rich philosophical history while also looking to the future. Rather than heading in the direction of geopolitics, 
Kui prefers time over space and argues for a different perspective on world history. From this vantage point, we may ask what will Sino-Futurism look, look like in the age of the Anthropocene? And what will it look like in the context of a widely developing fashion sector? Fashion's relation to technology arguably, arguably spans centuries. And since the late 20th century, like many other forms of culture production is inherently linked to the increased presence of digital technology. What is interesting to consider in the context of China is the accelerated timelines of change and how both fashion and fast track technological developments have been moving forward in parallel over the last decade. From this angle, from both a diversity of thinking and a deferring view of technology, I want to launch into a brief background sketch of the fashion sector in China, which I believe is needed and which ties into its economic and technological developments in recent decades. I'll focus on developments in the 21st century, especially the last decade, which will set the framework for both the contemporary and future projections, especially in how technology has played a key role in the development of, of a thriving and future forward fashion sector. In one part, it's about how technology is changing fashion through the devices and online realms that we use, and on the, uh, on the other hand, it investigates uh, if there are ways that technology is transforming the way fashion is produced and created in terms of design development and also the manufacturing side. Within this ecosystem, important roles are played by tech companies, fashion weeks, a highly adoptive industry, a highly adoptive general populace, the process of platformization, the political climate in terms of national interest, the global pandemic, among other factors. After this brief background sketch, I will go into several case studies that dissect different aspects of this ecosystem. As in many other countries, uh, textile production has been an engine for industrial expansion in China. After policies focusing more mostly on heavy industries, measures targeted at the growth of the light industries were incorporated in, five year, in the five-year plan starting in the 1980s. Textile and garment businesses rose to prominence as a means of generating wealth and jobs. As a result, Chinese businesses, uh, the majority of which were state-owned enterprise, enterprises, felt pressured to seek and obtain orders and currency from industrialized nations. This rapid uh, expansion necessitated achieving technical transfers in order to overhaul an out-of-date industry focused on low-quality mass production. The industry grew exponentially with some domestic textile manufacturers leading the charge in transforming themselves into garment makers, then retailers, and eventually apparel brands. Since the 2000s, another aspect has become critical for the industry's growth, fashion's inherent innovation and creative creativity. Fashion as one of the core industries in China's creative economy is highly visible due to its strength in visual communication and is playing an important part in the formation of the modern consumer society that the government aspires to. In a nutshell, entrepreneurs have faced all of the obstacles of the modern fashion industry in just a quarter of a century. Switching first from heavy to light industries, uh, light indus uh, switching first from heavy to light industries, then from textile production to apparel, and more recently transitioning to creativity-centered fa fashion labels. If we look closer at the developments in the 21st century, focusing on independent fashion, overall the industry of designer fashion started relatively slowly in the early 2000s, but entered a huge acceleration period from 2010 onward. Citing a recent industry report by Julian Consulting and the Air Claire Group, most of the current independent fashion labels were created since 2010, with the median age of businesses standing at 7.5 years on average. Um, and here in the slide, you can see um, this is something I'm actually still working on, but uh, basically trying to list out all um, these players in the uh, independent fashion scene. And what's, what you can really see is that since 2010, more and more uh, labels have started there uh, to operate, have set up their own uh, brands, uh, designers have set up their own brands. And um, also interestingly within this uh, group, um, most of these designers actually came back from studies abroad and, and then established a label in China. Um, growth of new labels has been explosive with an average 30% a year on year increase between 2011 and 2018, as you can see here in this chart. Driving this expansion are organic shifts like maturing consumer habits and the rise of China's soft power, as well as infrastructure milestones like the creation of buyer stores and their growth, as well as the democratization of fashion through social media and online platforms. The buyer store model, which first appeared in China and Shanghai in 1996, has grown enormously in popularity during the 2010s. Between 2016 and 2019, the total number of buyer stores in China increased from 300 to over 3,000, moving beyond first tier cities to second and third tier cities, including Chengdu, Shenyang, 
Changchun, Tianjin, and others. Another important factor driving these changes are the young generation native to the internet. Young millennials and Gen Z rely heavily on social networks to access global fashion information, breaking through geographical constraints of the past. It is this generation that is increasingly interested in, in and buying homegrown brands, looking for niche brands who offer uh, new, more culturally anchored uh, opportunities to reflect their personality through original designs. Looking further beyond the surface of these developments, we can see different layers of trajectories intertwine. And here I'll quote uh, from fashion scholars, Wessie Ling and Simona Reinach's analysis of fashion developments in China in their book, Fashion in Multiple Chinas. At first glance, the formation of contemporary Chinese fashion offers a compelling example of cultural, economic, and political entwinement across the globe. On closer examination, Chinese modernity in the 21st century cannot be merely under, underscored by Chinese hybridity typified between China and the West. Rather, it entails a power dynamic between China and the rest of the world, whereby constant negotiation is expected. While some consider that fashion is more concerned with the aesthetics, the aesthetics of surfaces rather than the specifics of cultural context and the logic of politics, the case of China, however, reveals cultural and political context as the very defining point of the making of its fashion. Having now sketched the broader context, I will go into the various case studies. Uh, the case studies serve to illustrate, dissect, and underline how much of a driving force technology has been in accelerating key changes in China's fashion ecosystem and pushing it into new and unknown directions. The cases consider key points in the fashion ma matrix, namely the fashion week, the fashion buyer, the influencer, and ultimately the designer. And in so doing, aim to also portray the breadth of these changes and a certain system change across the board. The first case study focuses on the phenomenon of democratization that has taken place as a consequence at times both intended and unintended of the virtual turn in fashion. Specifically looking at the cases of fashion weeks and instances of fashion presentations in China. Whereas the fashion industry in China was historically and arguably never as ex exclusive as its Western counterparts, technology has driven this into further and new directions. The main fashion week that stands out on the fashion calendar in China uh, and which is key for independent fashion is Shanghai Fashion Week, which is, was established in 2001 as a formal fashion week and grew out of the Shanghai International Fashion Culture Festival, a fashion event held annually since 1995 by the Municipal Authority of Shanghai, which at present still manages the operation. From only a handful of brands in the early 2000s, uh, the biannual event has now grown into an unmissable milestone in the fashion industry, attracting over 200 brands in 2020. Since its inception, the show has been firmly focused on Chinese fashion. In 2021, over 50% of brands were from Shanghai and nearly 20% referenced Chinese intangible cultural heritage as per a recent report. Building on this and as a major driver of a more accessible, one could say democratic or more audience or consumer focused fashion week, uh, live streaming has been changing the nature of, of fashion weeks across the board of Chinese fashion weeks across the board. The utilization of live streaming is not unique to the sector, however. Since the latter half of the 2010s, live streaming has slowly emerged in almost all corners of Chinese online experiences, with a major part in the e-commerce industry. Therefore, adopting live streaming as both a promotion and sales channel within the fashion sector was a relatively natural evolution. Yet Shanghai Fashion Week was relatively late to the party and held its first official Fashion Week live streaming event in 2019, following similar moves around the country by other events in 2018 and 19 in pre-pandemic times. The phenomenon proliferated during the COVID-19 outbreak and is now moving into a more digital focused format, combining offline events and live streaming experiences. The outbreak had a significant impact and it's useful to take a closer look at what happened exactly and what the effect eventually was. In March 2020, Shanghai Fashion Week, faced with a ban on public gatherings at the height of the pandemic in China, had the choice to either cancel Fashion Weeks altogether or move online. Having already established uh, a long-term partnership with Tmall since 2018, the choice was quickly made to move Fashion Week online and specifically onto Tmall's live streaming platform. Part of the beauty of this decision was in its speed and what it meant for the results, which were largely improvised. Uh, by the designers themselves, many being new to live streaming and resulting in a wide array of creative performances, ranging from behind the scenes photo shoots settings to music performances to comic skits and virtual environments. 
improvisation gave way to diversity, which is much less the case for regular live streaming in the fashion retail sector, which generally adheres to a standardized format of a live stream room, often a clothing rack, um, and a host introducing and praising garments in the manner of an auctioneer, banking in on the psychology of the scarcity of the moment. When Shanghai Fashion Week and Tmall announced this entirely live stream digital fashion week, it left many of their global counterparts scratching their heads. This online shift had all of a sudden drastically altered the very core on which fashion weeks were built, a physical and predominantly exclusive space for buyers and VIPs to preview new collections. The format, which also included see now, buy now, direct sales, saw over more, so modern, more than 150 designers and brands use live streaming to present over 1,000 products from their current and upcoming collections. Moreover, the core consumer focus catering to 800 million active users on Timo was a sea change in a fashion week's concept of its audience and has subsequently evolved the event into new directions. From this necessity in 2020, things grew further in 2021. Exactly one year after the Timo live stream iteration, the strategy evolved as a combination of online and offline events. From March 2021, Shanghai Fashion Week paired up with the top live streaming hosts of the Tmall platform, Austin Lee and another major female live streamer, leveraging the large following that both have amassed over the years. This time the goal was much more targeted and aimed to introduce Chinese designer fashion to a much, much larger audience than individual designers could, could garner on their own. And at the same time, through the see now, buy now format, drive online sales further. Throughout the week, uh, the focus was on three major live streaming events. The first being the official opening of Shanghai Fashion Week, a more PR focused stream on backstage, uh, focusing on backstage interviews and a fashion show with a mix of participating brands. The second on opening night, was the live stream of Austin Lee in collaboration with omnichannel fashion platform and incubator Labelhood, which presented a mix of catwalk fashion show and designer meets and meet and greets, as well as a sales session in the live stream room. An interesting strategy was the alternation, alternation between costly designer fashion and mass market makeup, so that prices weren't too hard to bear for the general public unfamiliar with the designer niche. The third event merged the two ends of the spectrum, inviting fashion designers to collaborate with the live streamers retail fashion brand on affordable pieces presented in a live stream bonanza. These iterations allow fashion shows and other fashion week events to reach a much wider audience while also allowing for instant feedback and audience engagement on very new levels. What emerges is a very different model of a fashion week away from the exclusivity of the 20th century model and towards a more audience and attention-driven event, one can say these developments are in parallel with wider changes in society in terms of online access and participation. In the wake of the pandemic, fashion weeks around the world followed Shanghai's move in terms of online iterations, but, much more, uh, but more often turned to video productions streamed through live streams, which continue into the present. While the Chinese model of its user-facing approach remains arguably more engaging, more connected, more accessible, and more user-driven, while also being highly localized. What follows is a new kind of democracy system on the whole, where creators, fans, and buyers and industry professionals can seemingly freely interact, yet one that relies heavily on digital platforms run by large corporations, where access is often a trade-off for data. This presents a double-edged sword. On the one hand, the system of the fashion week is becoming a much more open and democratic affair, but it comes at the cost of a buy-in into the platform system. And so here I'll show briefly, uh, uh, there's a short excerpt um, of the actual live stream. Uh,
你看这个是对外穿黑色，有没有？三个都是黑颜色。所以以后我也要看陈慧春，可是我下面要花一点。好了，那我们这样吧，让大家更了解我们的品牌，所以我们就让我们的设计师们第一次来介绍自己。我们男生设计师先来。OK， Hello， 大家好，我是 A t o n A 的设计师，我叫 Leo， 来拍摄一个。So, from the angle of a more public-faced and more direct-to-consumer-centered fashion week, I'll move further in that direction by looking at the audience.、Um, though, in this case, a very specific one—one one not necessarily actually viewing or consuming, but being perceived as such. I'm talking about influencers and specifically virtual influencers. The case of the virtual of virtual influencers also ties into emerging instances of the metaverse in China and is likely to have deep impacts on how fashion will evolve. Virtual influencers or virtual digital humans are entirely AI-developed characters with a human-like appearance, but are driven by powerful animation technology. They make realistic facial expressions and body movements and mimic the actions of real people. Virtual influencers are blank. When they are born, they only have a voice and appear an appearance developed digitally by their creators. The phenomenon of virtual influence did not virtual influencers did not originate in China, though has seen a great surge in the past few years with a boom from 2020 onward. At present, virtual influencers may not yet replace real influencers, but growth in this area is bound to happen sooner rather than later. One of the most significant advantages is their ability to collect data and engage with every single follower in a kind of hyper engagement. Zooming in on one of these influencers, I'm taking a look at Ayai. Do you think virtual people don't need to work? So says Ayai, one of China's first meta humans created by the Runmai Technology Company, in a post on Little Red Book. The virtual KOL joined Alibaba recently as digital manager of the T-Mall superbrand. There, she juggles multiple identities: NFT artist, digital curator, fashion brand manager, top digital person, and more. Ayai was created in May of 2021 and is one of the many AI influencers in China's virtual influencer industry and one of the most closely linked to the fashion sector. Local companies are experimenting with digitally produced KOLs as influencers continue to be a significant marketing strategy for driving sales in China. These influencers present a safer alternative to popular real-life stars that are increasingly getting caught up in scandals. Ayai is hyper-realistic. The attention paid to physical details in each of her posts is remarkable. Her looks are always skillfully crafted. Her short blonde hair is styled to perfection for each image, and her motionless expression is both intimidating and serene. Ayai is virtually perfect. This distinct combination of detailed CGI work and and a well-developed life narrative is the key to Ayai's success successful collaboration with major brands. In her short lifespan, she has already worked with the names with names like Louis Vuitton, Porsche, and has posed for photos with China's fashion influencers Grace Chow and William Chen, as you can see here, as well as sported、uh, the looks of Chinese fashion designer champions、um, Chen Peng and Xander Zhou. These collaborations demand high-quality aesthetics and intricate narratives that support the concept behind the character. Ayai is also cover girl for the new Mo magazine, China's brand new virtual magazine, co-created by Huasheng Media and Ali Mama,、uh, with its first edition edited by Xander Zhou, launched just earlier this year. Here we see media also responding to the virtual push and leveraging the existence of virtual KOL, KOLs within these iterations. And Ayai isn't alone. From the region's most internationally popular avatar star Ruby Gloom to the more indie Poka Poka or Angie Ling Luo Tianyi or the Honor of Kings virtual boy group, to only to name only a few, the phenomenon is proving popular, especially among younger generations. According to research by、uh, by streaming platform ITE, 64% of Chinese 14 to 24 year olds followed virtual idols in 2019. At the same time, what this phenomenon begs to question. What does it mean for authenticity, or will it alter our perception of what authenticity means and what we value as such? Another part of the divide is the fact of the immense human labor behind autonomous processes. There is the myth of universal automation, with technologies framed as a destitutive force sweeping the globe. But this fiction ignores the social, cultural, and geographical forces that shape technologies at a local level. Enormous teams of engineers, creatives, and storyboarders are the enablers of these virtual characters, with inevitable embedded and coded biases. Another factor of contention is how we as humans relate to our digital counterparts and the potential implications. In one of many online reports on the phenomenon, the following comment is made: 
Stella Chen, a Shanghainese woman in her 30s, follows the virtual influencer Ling. Chen said the, a the AI idol's perfection made her effortlessly cool and a moving art piece. Chen said, because Ling's so perfect, she doesn't even bother, she didn't actually even bother to compare herself to the virtual star, and that's actually freeing. This re reveal, reveals a kind of layeredness in our relation. We can relate, but it's actually not the same. And at, another issue that came up earlier in earlier discussions leading up to this presentation, across the board, looking at the gender divide of virtual digital humans in China, there is a larger trend towards female characters. Likely, this is a continuation of the gender bias prevalent in AI and voice automation for digital assistants globally. At the same time, these virtual digital humans are heralded as safe counterparts to real influencers embroiled in scandal. Yet in the latter, there's often a prevalence in men. I believe once the hype clears, uh, there will likely be a more nuanced coexistence be between IRL KOLs and virtual digital humans, both male and female. Once virtual, digital, virtual KOLs are able to establish this, themselves, the question is presented on how these influencers will further evolve into, into the fashion matrix. Can we anticipate AI-driven virtual influencers growing into their own brand developers or even designers in their own right? In this way, taking cues from the career paths of influencers IRL and in turn driven by the same, same machine learning and AI that brought them into being. If that would be the case, one path to success would be to join the incubation program of Labelhood, which is what I'll focus on in the next case study. In my introduction earlier, I introduced this case uh, as representing the fashion buyer, which is what Labelhood in its early days started out as. But today is actually a lot more and a phenomenon one cannot avoid when looking, looking into contemporary designer fashion in China today. What is Labelhood? From encounters with the platform, one could derive the following monitors or areas of activity online store, physical store, fashion showcase platform, talent scout, fashion incubator, fashion showroom, media platform, fashion education entity, fashion community manager, and it doesn't really end there. Labelhood's own description of themselves as stated on their Tmall landing page uh, is as follows, freely translated from the Chinese, quote, from a buyer shop that supports Chinese independent design to an art festival, that gives voice to avant-garde fashion, to a fashion academy that exists in absolute time and space. Labelhood aims to connect individuals and the outside world, China and the world through the window of fashion culture, so as to promote individuals to establish independent aesthetic judgment and cultural identity, and enjoy democratic fashion culture." Unquote. In a recent in interview on the new business WeChat, WeChat account, uh, one of Labelhood's most visible co-founders, Tasha Liu, also stated the following. We are also constantly debating whether Labelhood is a brand or a service provider or a retail platform. When we want to express our own language, we are like a brand. When we think about incubating brands, we become a service provider. If you look at the financial statements, most of the revenue comes from sales against, again, a retailer. What are the origins of the ship shifting identity and how did this epitome of omni-channel reach come to take this form? Founded in 2009 as Dongyang by Tasha Liu, Charles Wang and Lang Nan, a brick and mortar store in Beijing, which focused on stocking young Chinese designers, which was a pioneering concept at the time. From then, the store has embarked on a metamorphic development until now. I'll run through some of the key dates uh, and developments and then reflect a bit on what this model means for China's fashion ecosystem, as well as how it ties into the question of technology. After its initial establishment in Beijing, Dongliang opened its first store in Shanghai in 2011. In 2013, the Shanghai Fashion Designers Association invited Dongliang to collaborate on a showcase of Chinese designers at London Fashion Week, which proved successful. Building on the success of the London event, in 2014, the focus shifted back to Shanghai and Shanghai Fashion Week invited Dongliang to host a one-day showcase at their main venue titled Dongliang One Day, showcasing six catwalk shows and four fashion forums. The format was highly successful as a way to present and support the growing roster of young design graduates returning to China from studies overseas and setting up their own label, which were ever increasing in numbers. At the same time, it was also beneficial for adding fresh blood to this brand stable of the Dongliang stores. From then on, Dongliang would present a select selection of emerging designers at each, each iteration of Shanghai Fashion Week, growing further with each new Fashion Week. And in 2016, they decided to formalize the event further through setting up a dedicated venue and rebranding the platform as Labelhood and the event as Labelhood Pioneer Fashion Art Festival, while the store remained under the Dongliang name. 
The Labelhood Pioneer uh, Fashion Art Festival was a new format for Shanghai Fashion Week um, overall, and also the first iteration of a Fashion Week event triggered at the general fashion curious and especially younger public. The event considered of, cons consisted of fashion shows, fashion and art exhibitions, live streaming, pop-up shops, industry talks, brand experience spaces, a labelhood market, and other ways to participate. In 2017, they made their first major move online, opening a Tmall flag flagship store and also participating in the Tmall Global Fashion Festival held every fall. As stated in their official timeline, by 2018, the brand recognition of Labelhood exceeded that of Dongliang, and they decided on a merger of the store and the festival together, sticking with the name Labelhood for all their activities, while Dongliang continues separately under different management as a store in Beijing. From the year 2020 and beyond, also for Labelhood, the pandemic pushed everything further online, and live streaming became a regular part of the festival, adding further partnerships with Tmall and more recently Little Red Book. Reflecting back on all of these developments in the past 12 years, Labelhood has done more than open a buyer shop. In essence, its business mo model is to prove to the market that there are good independent designer brands in China, utilizing three main, way main ways to realize success for budding brands and Labelhood itself, talent scouting, publicity, and sales. As a result, Labelhood grew up with the Chinese independent designers and gradually evolved into a multi-channel brand incubation management platform and pioneer fashion experience hub. With all of this made possible and accelerated by the use of technology, from social media to e-commerce, live streaming and strategic KOL partnerships. What this has meant in terms of numbers is that over the past 10 years, uh, 10 seasons, Labelhood has tapped more than 300 Chinese independent designer labels, creating annual sales numbers of nearly 300 million. A core aspect to the success of the labelhood model is the focus on the public, on the public, on interfacing direct to consumers, growing a following that has recognized the value of the platform and what it has done for the fashion community. This is especially underlined by the scheduling of their shows, which seems unique in the world. Each brand at its fashion festival needs to do two shows. The first is for professional buyers and media. The second, which is essentially a copy of the same show, is specifically Ooh, sorry. It's specifically open to a young general audience. In this way, Labelhood has gradually built up a stable and sympathetic consumer community for Chinese independent fashion design. At the same time, a generation of young consumers has gradually generated a sense of pride and a strong interest in and recognition of Chinese designers, in part tying into a larger political agenda of the Chinese economy. Overall, homegrown designer brands in China are experiencing the best of times as Chinese consumers become increasingly aware and receptive to Chinese designer labels. What we've seen from Labelhood's model and its development is the increasing pull, power, and strength of a massive hyper-consumerist and hyper-connected market and how it can impact creative output through user interaction and instant feedback, which presents perspective which presents a perspective reversal of traditional designer-driven processes as everything becomes increasingly interconnected and datafied. Another factor to consider in this model is the hybrid nature of the merging of both incubation and commerce as a key driver. Whereas incubators have been present and active in fashion weeks around the world, consider Fashion East in London New and New York CFDA's uh, fashion incubator. These initiatives have mostly been not-for-profit or government-backed here we see a uniquely homegrown model adopting savvy business acumen with a real mission to nurture homegrown fashion with and for a local audience. As we look to the future, it will be interesting to see in a post-pandemic world if a move towards the international context might once again be desirable for platforms such as Labelhood, as with the enduring lockdowns, the focus has increasingly been internal. From the platform's championing, designer, championing designers, we move to the final case in point. What is the perspective, perspective of the designer in all of this? How do young designers navigate the industry today? And what strategic assets uh, can they leverage? How is technology influencing their practice beyond hyper-social networks and e-commerce? For this case study, I look into the budding independent brand Nan Knits, which specializes in knitwear. Though there are others on the scene today, with similar focuses such as Noom, Ray, Swaying Knit, and Jichen, among others. Though the newness of the brand and the fact that it is based out of the production base of Dongguan and that it signed onto Labels Hood's incubation program only just last year, makes it an inter interesting case in the context of my inquiry. 
What this case also tries to underline is how certain emerging designers have been building their brands on unique te technological innovations and methodologies with a focus on machine and production technologies. Nunnets was founded in 2021 and debuted their first collection last October at Shanghai Fashion Week 2022, uh, Shanghai Fashion Week Spring Summer 2022. According to their brand statement, the brand explores a new futuristic style in the context of Asian culture creating tensions between the past, the present, and the future, combined with high-end knitting technology to create innovative designs. At the same time, through the research and development of technology, uh, the use of innovative materials and threads, it also aims to break stereotypes often associated with knitwear. Created by Nanhu, a post-90s avid gamer, the design concept of his debut season starts from an array of innovative fabrics and experimental thread. The collection evokes neon lights, bionic flowers, metal shields, virtual armor, Chinese decorative elements, and other visual elements with cutting edge knitting technology in order to weave a certain promise of the future into the designs, allowing the aesthetic illusion of space and time to overlap. The Nanet studio is located in Dongguan, and as I mentioned in my introduction, since the reform and opening up, the Pro River Delta region has attracted a large number of foreign enterprises and promoted the development of the garment manufacturing industry. Nan recounts his struggles in setting up the studio, quote, for an emerging designer brand that focuses on knitwear, it's not easy to find skilled craftsmen and factories that are in step with each other, unquote. And although he would prefer the studio to be located in Shenzhen where he now lives, Dongguan makes the most sense in terms of the available factories, machines, and skilled labor. To set up his studio he was able to obtain the required German machinery through a connection in the Zhongda company. And through this connection also obtained access to the company's recent layoffs in the wake of the pandemic, employing these technicians into the studio. If we take a closer look at the garments, Nanet's work is different from conventional knitwear. Although loop threads are still clearly visible, the original characteristics of knitting are cleverly hidden. The garments are produced using inlay knitting, making the original structure lose elasticity and becoming stiffer. In the process of forming the surface from the thread, he uses a one by one stitch, knitting every other stitch so that the yarn caught in the middle is exposed. This craftsmanship is the foundation of the brand vision, making the quality of the materials essential. He comments on this as, follow, as follows, quote, in the eyes of most people, knitting is a tedious repetitive work, but how to make a breakthrough, breakthrough in this cycle is a proposition I will continue to explore. I want to create a kind of knitting that goes, that belongs to the future, unquote. Nun's path to where, uh, where he is today has not been an uncommon one. Hailing from the provinces, province of Hunan, he left for Beijing in his high school years to go to an art prep school. And from there, he enrolled in a BA network program at LCF in London, choosing knitwear pragmatically as there was a higher potential of getting in compared to women's wear or men's wear pathways. Keen to study further, after graduation, he embarked on an MA at the RCA. And after successfully completing the program, it was only natural to return to China first with the ambition to set up a knitwear innovation production studio that would aid other designers in their knitwear developments. Nan soon found that Dongguan, although useful in terms of the machinery and production, proved difficult to access for the mostly Shanghai-based designers, while the competitor was already active in the Shanghai region. Having already invested in machinery, the jump to an independent brand was not too difficult to make. About his brand ambitions, uh, Nan comments, quote, the future is full of possibilities and so is knitting. The process can take countless forms in different contexts and even uh, in different hands will show different features, regardless of gender, race, and class restrictions." Unquote. Although the first collection of Nanets has been well received, garnishing praise and positive feedback, but the process to brand maturity takes time, effort, and learning through engaging with the market and customers. At present, to create a garment, Nan needs to make a knitting sample, then write a program on the computer, and then have the machine operator calculate the number of stitches and yarn size according to the over overall garment outline, stating, the average time we make a garment is about six hours, uh, some complex clothes take more than 30 hours and produce no waste. Therefore, all, the price is also relatively high. This may mean a need to tweak the development model in future, development model in future collections. If we look at the tra trajectory of, non, of the non-knits label, several factors are at play. 
young designers can find ways to leverage the strong production base and technological know-how that is present locally and find ways to innovate within these systems, moving from an outdated positioning and pivoting to new methods of making and creating. At the same time, with a growing fashion community, opportunities for brand development can arise relatively early on, allowing budding designers to mature at a much faster pace, building upon community gains and insight in recent years and through the nurturing of multiple labels. It will be interesting to see if more young designers can leverage the technological know-how and production capacity available locally and in turn and turn this into innovative design production, integrating other factors of increasing import, such as sustainability, ethical practices, and diversity. Uh, here, I'll, I'll quickly also show a short video of um, uh, the development process of Nanmit's. Now, bringing these different factors, changes, and evolutions of the fashion ecosystem together, what we can see is an acceleration on all levels. These accelerations are tied into changes and stimuli both at a policy level as well as developments in the wider economic spheres within China. In part, there is a phenomenon of a uniquely Chinese platform network and internet sphere, which is highly localized and culturally specific. At the same time, global trends such as the metaverse and the rise of NFTs are influ influencing the sphere as well. If we think back to the idea of cosmotechnics, this thinking ties into the concept of a kind of decentralized localization that we see happening. The future could be seen to embody many small things, forming networks and communities. There is an emergence of democratization in terms of access and enabling of creativity, while the larger system is still one of capitalism, capitalism with Chinese characteristics. And these developments remain driven by large corporations that do the enabling with all kinds of coding biases and assumptions that are embedded in these systems. At the same time, the virtual world brings on a dematerialization of fashion in a physical sense, but not necessarily in a monetary sense. Although I did not go into it within my case studies, uh, fashion NFTs are also on the rise in China. And with NFTs, we see different forms of monetization of creativity and virtual asset building taking place. The question emerges on what this will mean for the future of creative output within China's fashion ecosystem. Another factor at play is that at present, there is a growing and increasingly robust local market for Chinese independent designer fashion, which drives a lot of young designers back to China, making them focus more locally in order to grow faster and better in a short period of time. The various ecosystem pillars discussed in the case studies are also increasingly maturing in their own positions and in their own right, building on technological advancement while both absorbing and nurturing homegrown talent Think of, the development, think of the development of Shanghai Fashion Week or the enormous incubation efforts of labelhood. This also contributes to a more inward turn where opportunities and support are plenty. And finally, the travel restrictions that the pandemic has brought and remain in place today, a period of nearly two years also contributed to this inward turn. While alongside this market triggered phenomenon over the last 10 years, we have also seen a general rise of nationalism and national pride that is giving, uh, driving part of the surge and the increasing demand of fashion from homegrown designers in China. 
The Austin Lee live stream was also a strong example of this in the way the content, content was presented and the wording during the live stream, emphasizing a sense of duty towards the audience to be Chinese, to support Chinese talent, to buy local. Both nationalism and technological optimism are ways of exploiting a certain level of desire. This phenomenon is a turn away from the globalization that has taken place over the past decades and can be seen emerging around the globe in the wake of the pandemic, coupled by economic losses, political uncertainty, and other factors. In light of this, looking broadly at the maturing of Chinese independent fashion, one could, pre could pre predict two potential markers of success that still tie into globalization. On the one hand, a globally successful independent Chinese fashion brand. Here, several are already making strides. Think of Xander Zhou, Feng Chen Wang, Uma Wang, Yang Li, and many more. Although one can argue that there may still be some way to go in this regard. And on the other hand, a Chinese designer leading an international fashion house. The latter, uh, as of yet, has not, not yet emerged, and it remains to be seen how this will evolve, also in the face of, of the increasing drive to online and digital. If we look at the essentials, culture with or without technology has always been the driving factor behind greater societal change. Before political reform, there must be cultural change and that cultural transformation must begin with ourselves. It is up to us to create new symbols and meaning within fashion culture, regardless of nationality, whether virtual or real. We can see that in contemporary China, emerging fashion creators and online digital and the, its online digital community are a driving force for this cultural change. To conclude, I'll share a quote uh, from one of the young designers working towards this change and towards greater global recognition, namely uh, designer Yang Li, currently heading the Hermès-backed fashion endeavor of Shangxia. He states, it's like imagining an empty chair at a round table of luxury fashion brands that should be for a Chinese representative. What a great mission to embark on. We'll give it our best shot. So this is where I will end my uh, talk today. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone who uh, uh, yeah, helped me in this and uh, agreed to participate in interviews and other, uh, other forms. Um, uh, yeah, I'll give now the floor, I think, to back to Tanya. I yeah, believe. very quickly. Thank you so much, Anushka, for this very, very interesting and insightful presentation. Um, we from the design and architecture team, of course, have the privilege to um, accompany you um, during the duration of your um, fellowship. So we have seen um, the development and progress of your research, but it was also the first time for us today to hear your conclusions. So that was very exciting. Thank you. Um, now, since the time for the panel discussion is limited, let's jump right into it. But I would like to briefly remind um, our audience and please start um, sending your questions. My colleague Noel will monitor them and then address them right after the panel. Yeah, so uh, let's get started. Um, I'd like to once again welcome also our panel guest, uh, Xiaowei Ye. Xiaowei, thank you so much for taking the time um, to join us today. Um, thank you, Tanya, and uh, congr congratulations on Anushka on this kind of very comprehensive studies about kind of contemporary Chinese history from a very specific point of view of uh, independent designers. So um, maybe um, we could kick off the discussion um, and by, um, so I'd like to ask you, Xiaowei, could you um, give a first reflection or comment on what we've just heard from, from Anushka or certain um, topics that she has addressed? Well, okay, I can try my best because since it's a very kind of comprehensive rundown, we have just went through like, what, 45, 50 minutes of um, what's happening basically, even if you think about like, Shanghai Fashion Week has like 20 years, even neighborhood is like 11 years, right? So either you count it so-called if you want to see, and actually I would think like contemporary fashion into China should start it from like the late 80s, early 90s, when the foreign brands, when the Chinese is its own brand, which is like a more, quite a few of them like Erlo's, K-boxing, whatever, they just recently cel celebrated 40 years anniversary, also leaning. So we can say like, a, if we want to say there's a contemporary Chinese fashion history, we'll say roughly like 40 years. And then about 30 years ago in the early 90s, the foreign brands start coming into China. And then 20 years ago, you have Shanghai Fashion Week. And 10 years ago, you have Leverhood. So let's just put this as a time frame. When, you are, when we are looking at kind of like contemporary Chinese fashion history. So I think it's very interesting, like Anushka choose the independent Chinese designer as a 
cutting point to recount this history because we know like everything we talk about China or fashion industry, whatever is such a wide topic. It's very hard to say like you can get any kind of conclusion. So what I'm interested at first is like, um, so a lot of uh, phenomena Anushka described either in terms of technology or marketing strategies or the emergence of the showrooms, the whole kind of new business model, it's actually kind of right on, on the wider development of China in terms of fashion or manufacturing industry, which is like a, there's basically two big sectors, right? One is the, they are one of the largest uh, consumer market in the whole world, and with one of the most mature e-commerce technology. So a lot of things you describe, uh, uh, independent designer, basically they are kind of riding on the trend, trends like a, the very sophisticated, advanced, complicated, even e-commerce platforms. And then the other side is actually very also mature, advanced kind of manufacturing systems. So I am actually wondering, so what is the role of creative creativities in the whole, this larger, bigger pictures? I think that's uh, one thing we need to address when you talk about the Chinese fashion industry, because the maturities of the whole um, economy system, manufacturing system, market planning, whatever, it's so overwhelming largely and in the global scale. So what does the individual, not individual, what is the creativity of either young designers or bigger brands or people who want to be brands? What does the role of creativity play into this much larger picture? So that's my number one questions. And number two is, um, I think we're trying to kind of formulate uh, our own narratives or methodologies or way of doing things. Of, uh, if there's a, a, a separate way of uh, describing Chinese fashion industry or Chinese fashion language or aesthetics. And then I think Anushka kind of quoting like the whole cosmotechnics, like maybe there's a, it's kind of, it, it's possibly that there's a potential of a decentralized way of doing things or either it's in terms of manufacturing or distribution or consumptions or even designing or whatever, but it is a decentralized or it's just an isolated market. So I think it's quite a different concept and quite a different way of seeing things. So this is the two things I pick on from this wonderful presentations of the past 40, 50 minutes. And I think, I don't know if, Anyone or, or Anushka, or we can just kind of discuss about this. Mm -hmm. Anushka, would you like to 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 try to give a, a reply? Yes, um, yes, yes. Um, yeah. So point one, um, and yeah, indeed. I mean, there's a lot to go into, and there was not enough time in, let's say, those fifteen minutes. Um, creativity is indeed a very important factor and interesting to kind of look into. Um, and what you say, so in part, there's this whole growth within the whole infrastructure, which is driven not by these designers, let's say it's all like the industry and it's the online platforms, Alibaba, Taobao, that, that's the setting up of that and all this, these, this framework, let's say. And I think um, like the, let's say the bigger players or bigger uh, apparel brands, et cetera, have driven those, also helped drive those, um, uh, developments. Um, it's also helped, I mean, then that's what we're starting to see now, I would say, helped these younger independent uh, fashion designers who are actually trying to explore what it means uh, to be an, a creative independent fashion designer in China. And as a Chinese designer, what does that mean? Um, I briefly also in my introduction, uh, try, uh, like it's still an ongoing process of, of trying to kind of map all of these designers, who they are, um, where they're based out of, uh, how old they are, when they started their label and where they studied. And actually that's an interesting factor and I didn't actually go into this a lot. Um, but many of the young emerging designers uh, that are working in China today, um, I would say nearly 80% have studied abroad and at, and very specific, a lot of them actually at the major um, fashion schools overseas. Um, so LCF in London, RCA, uh, Antwerp and uh, Parsons in New York. Um, so really uh, they go there and then often also uh, end up doing uh, internships or work or start working um, in the industries there. Then after a year or two, they tend to return 
and then actually because of all these factors being really the market being really good um all these the like the, the incubators being there in place shanghai fashion week being a platform that welcomes all this new talent they've very quickly been able to establish their own brand with the help of these factors and i feel that that creativity has is actually also being pushed now um, or they get the chance to push that further uh, because of this framework um, but this is a really very recent development um, so i do think um, I do think the creativity factor is growing as well. Um, plus, it's, I mean, it has also been in the background, um, something that the Chinese government has been trying to push in, not only in fashion, in other creative sectors as well, as it tries to pivot, um, uh, yeah, its focus in terms of, uh, of its populace, its working populace um, uh, for the future, basically, yeah. Um, maybe does someone else want to respond also on the top or maybe that's, Tyner, that's the the end of the point, or to the next one? There is Sorry. so um, there is so much we could talk about. Um, it was also, I think it's very interesting, Shawei, that you mentioned that um, the, maybe parts of the development are also very closely linked to the overall development of the Chinese fashion industry since the 80s, which is has a very unique disposition due to the history. Um, and that probably also perhaps plays into, into it or in plays into how, how fast these things are happening at the moment. Um, you can disagree um, if, if, if you think that's not correct. Um, so Anushka, you've observed um, a lot of different developments and, and I would be curious, even if it's probably too early to say so, but we know that the digital is a huge trend at the moment, a huge hype. You were also mentioning the metaverse, NFTs. Let's also think maybe about digital fashion, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm wondering, um, and that's a question to both of you, um, which of these developments do you think are actually more like a trend maybe also because of the pandemic you know a lot of things had to shift online in order to continue and um which developments will evoke a real and a long-lasting change um in the industry and um, for both the creators and the consumers also if you think about democratization etc so do you have any um thoughts on that uh, maybe very quickly i'll um i'll respond to that plus tie it into uh the other comment that uh Xiaowei made um because yeah so the one hand there's the, the idea of the trend and the uh the instant like the the problematic let's say of the pandemic um on the one hand uh and then um uh or actually i'll, I'll what Shawi just mentioned, or this word that she used was decentralization, which I did uh, go into it, or I mentioned in my conclusion. Um, I mean, the idea of decentralization is coming a, le a lot out of the, let's say the, the metaverse, you could say trend, but I do think it's it's going to be something that really, that will have a, a, some sort of uh, materialization in the future, not just as a trend. Um, but I mean, it's still questionable in how decentralized something like this metaverse could be, because uh, ultimately there are there is the technology which is often organized or uh, set up by a larger corporation or uh, yeah, a company, sometimes government backed as well. Um, so that is definitely a question. Um, then uh, then the other factor was this kind of like, yeah, so what does it mean in China and is, um, is it decentralized or is it more a factor of isolation um, between China and the rest of the world, which the actually pandemic has, uh, I think it kind of exacerbated. Um, the issue within China, I think, and especially if I looked at all these, of, of the idea of fashion, of uh, designer fashion in China, um, a part of the problem is that actually the market here now is so good or really pretty good is that a lot of designers um, tend to just roll with it and run with it here um, and kind of forget about and and, and the yeah, pandemic has not allowed people to travel uh, so freely. Um, so I think there is potential for more crossover in that in that regard um, and I'm hopeful that that will happen. Um, but that will have to wait like in a in a, for a post pandemic world. Um, yeah. Well, 
Yeah, I Maybe think I, I don't even, well, I don't know the answer for is really a decentralized or is it just isolation and also decentralized because it has to do with the whole structure emerging or uh, actually keep changing structures for the whole, whole, the whole world um, economy systems. But for one, I can see, uh, we're talking about Chinese young designers. I think this kind of isolation period time give them few good opportunities, which include one, finding the kind of national, com like a national confidence and then or opportunities to look into more about what they can take out from their own um, heritage and storytelling. And of course, depends on each of them, like some dig deeper and some are just more superficial using symbols. And then the other one is because it kind of gives them also a break because it's a huge market for them. And then for a while, people has really less easy assets to buy foreign brands. So it actually gives the opportunity for the good designer has kind of a, a breeze to really to grow. And I think thirdly, which is I'm very interesting and curious, want to find out from like the earlier, I didn't catch on that, but yeah, like uh, especially like the example you're using, like a, for example, like a Nan Knit, right? So I think a lot of young Chinese designers, I mean, they're educated in, in the West for particular reasons, but I was thinking the really good one is the real development will be after they're coming back to China. Probably there's not so many kind of inspiration in terms of creativity with their kind of global colleague, but there's a very uh, mature and interesting manufacturer base here, which they can collaborate together on. And then uh, I know quite a few examples other than the net, uh, netness. So by working together with the manufacturers or even kind of other kind of technical developers, and then that kind of give them a kind of different, I wouldn't say it's cultural, maybe this is like techno veneers for them to come up with something new. And then, so even like a then knit, and then there's quite a few others and they're very young and new. This is probably like a, a, a new beginners for what Chinese designer in, this kind of particular millions, they can develop something really truly innovative by directly working with the source and which is uh, happened to be in these sectors and China has actually quite uh, events like a textile manufacturing and all kind of the other kind of fashion production um, processing. Um, and of course, also then the unique platforms that Anushka um, introduced as well. Um, if we talk about these platforms a bit more in detail, so one thing that I would be interested in is also because you, Shawei, you, you were working with um, or actually also establishing your own um, a platform um, for fashion or fashion-based content already pre-pandemic. So um, it would be interesting also to hear from you um, a bit more about, um, you know, how have you been um, observing the importance of online um, platforms and how are they evolving? How are they changing? Um, and then on the other hand, also, I was wondering, so for designers who enter the market, they use these various platforms. Um, um, so, yeah, so, so what are the challenges they are facing? Anushka, you briefly um, addressed this, or let's say even the downside, because if we think about who has the control, and you already mentioned, there are huge corporations behind it. There are algorithms, there is paid or um, sponsored content. There is a huge amount of competition, I, I assume, um, especially on, on, on like online platforms like um, Tmall, et cetera. Um, and there is also, uh, the collection of data and there also digital influencers play a very specific role or part so um you know like how how shall a designer navigate this but actually also a consumer well uh i'll answer what i can i think at the very beginning it's really a lot of try and error because like when we say there's a dominant like the uh, e-commerce platform like a uh, Alibaba and Taobao, of course, now you have more and more, right? But originally you have mainly is Timo or whatever. So even two years ago when the pandemic first hit and Shanghai Fashion was the first one who moved everything online. And how can they just be the first one to move everything online because they were with Timo. So there's already an existing infrastructure there. But then is Timo the right environment for independent designers? I mean, a lot of them find out after one or two years, maybe not because it's too was to a very, not to only mention it, it, its own very aggressive marketing and it's the way it's facing the consumers, the consumer base and et cetera, et cetera. So I think over the past two years, 
I think designers and then their online platforms, uh, they're trying to find a better way to sue each other. But in the meantime, there's more and more like kind of online platform is emerging. And I think right now, most designers will agree, maybe the red will be the best platform for them because it's more like community oriented. They can really cultivate, cultivate it their own community is it's almost like Instagram. And, and at the very beginning, it doesn't really have the commerce um, uh, functions, but now I think they do, and then they're going to try to develop that. So maybe it's a much better platform for independent designers. So I think this is all kind of evolving from like, a, you be part of like a much bigger platform, but then you'll totally probably be eaten up by it. And then even including those live streaming I do, I think there's there's a lot of trying. It's all very interesting. But app, each, each, but the point is each time after you try, you have some conclusion, right? So mm -hmm. and then my feeling is most of the time it's like a, it's not really working. So they keep looking for the next platform and next platform. But in the meantime, then the platform itself, the ecology of like a digital platform and e-commerce is in China is also evolving. So right now it seems like red is the most suitable one, but who knows? Maybe there was better ones mm -hmm. after this. Okay. Anushka, would you like to say something or? Maybe just in response to something that uh, Xiaowei just said. Um, uh, I mean, in terms of, yeah, uh, or we, you mentioned Taba also, and I think what, it, what we can see there is that it like it seems to only work for once you've established yourself a little bit um, and have a certain following and a certain customer base um, and then you see designers uh, starting to kind of slowly build that um, on Taobao um, I think what what's been more like for the for those that were that find that difficult and maybe that that migrate to um, a little red book what has been important, and I start, I talked about this briefly in the first part of my presentation, is the actual is the buyer store, the idea of the buyer store, and actually, they've been driving a lot, or they've been helping nurture um, young designers through setting up their stores, um, both physical and and digital online, um, also on Tmall. Um, so through, let's say, uh, through their orders of these uh, these designers' works and and, uh, and and stocking them in their stores, um, they've kind of been able to develop that, and that they they have also profited or have grown uh, due to the online infrastructure as well. Um, at the same time, these buyer stores have also in turn uh, found uh, or have profited from the development uh, of Shanghai Fashion Week in a more as a more maturing, let's say, Fashion Week with all its showrooms, many many showrooms and uh, and other uh, trade like more trade oriented um, events. Yeah, that's and actually I wanted to um, briefly also address um, labelhood again because you said it's a unique Chinese model and and I was wondering also if we think about uh, Yukui and and um, um, the techno opti optimism that you've mentioned, but like yeah, do you think it would work in other countries or is it really tied to how the Chinese use technology or how it's advancing, you know, very quickly? Does it have to do something? Maybe that's also something uh, Shawei could address. Um, does it have to do something with the consumer? Is it a unique kind of consumer that's very different from elsewhere or more digitally native or, or yeah, open, et cetera? So that would be interesting to hear a bit more about that. Since we might also have, you know, international audience. So um, I'm also yeah, asking, asking me. Okay, true. Sure. I mean, well, I don't know if labelhood is so unique or not, but I think it's definitely is a wonderful existence as, as what Anishka address is an incubator, whatever. But I do actually would like to, yeah, like, because uh, Anishka mentioned, uh, which I forgot to mention earlier, like there's really a, a emergency of all these select store. They play in more and more important roles, especially for the independent designer here. That's basically their mainly selling channels. And then the rising of it, I think has a lot to do with, they're driven by the, the, the growing middle classes people in the major cities. They're mm -hmm. looking for certain kind of lifestyle, which is probably more cosmopolitan, more Western. They want something different than big department stores or Taobao or Tmos or whatever. So, and then, so that's why, especially that's why this kind of, there's a, this uh, new retail environments, it is select store or very few like a fine department store is kind of rising because they provide certain kind of 
experience and that experience provide you opportunity to take pictures, to experience different things, to show you your, your your peers like you have some yeah it's kind of aspiration for certain kind of lifestyle and that does help a lot for independent designers so in a way so independent designer is also is kind of part of the stable of I'm having a much more I don't know I hate to say western lifestyle but let's just call it cosmopolitan lifestyles so together with the, there's a more and more and people are, keep, are paying more attention to like a new lifestyle brands, not just only fashion brands is coming out. Well, people pay a lot of pay attention to perfumes nowadays and then to other kind of like an, a home decos. This is all kind of new rising sectors um, in terms of like a, this other than just a fashion design. So I think has to do with this kind of maturing and then growing of a new and younger middle class. In China, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anushka? And, and same thing, we can probably also say like, uh, so that's why Anushka said, there's definitely a big potential about all this like uh, virtual fashions or, or metaverse, even though it's so new and no one really know how to comment on it. And just for example, like this week, there's a decentralized meta, meta, metaverse fashion way, right? So actually there is like a, I counted like a full Chinese brand or designer participated in it. Well, most of them, we don't know who they are. Like two I know, but the other three, I never heard of it. But mm -hmm. I think it's kind of new opportunities for people to tap into this kind of new. Life. And also I think it's, it's because why they're doing that, it, again, it's driven by consumers because there's mm -hmm. like a, like we all know like the cliche of Z generations, but I think in China, there's a huge like gaming, communities or gaming technicians and gaming, I don't know, programmers. So in a way, so that could be an, another big area, which is, it's, it, it might attract like a potential growth. And what do you think about digital influencers or digital influencing as opposed to real influencing? Well, you, like, it's, I, well, I don't know, because first of all, I mean, they appear to a sector of people, which is definitely not me. I'm, I'm sure they appear to much younger audience, people who are used to, again, like a lot of them coming from like a, the old gaming industries. Mm -hmm. And then of course, like a small companies or whatever will try to make it into an influence by collaborating with designers and get into like a fashion industry, like it become, but I, don't really know how big the inferences are because for me, KOL need characters, need personalities. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you don't have a personality and you don't have whatever, you're just being generated and programmer. And then, and I don't really think you can really attract a lot of followers. Mm -hmm. So that's also a development that is, uh, you know, we yet have to keep observing and then see where, where it goes, I would say. Um, Anushka, I have a pers rather personal question for you. There's something I'm curious about. So, um, because um, of course, when you started your research, you had some initial assumptions about the impact um, or influence of technology and online platforms. And it was also in the midst uh, of the pandemic or actually at the, at the beginning of the pandemic. So what were your initial assumptions actually? And then um, to what extent does the outcome of, of your, your research um, maybe differ? Because I know that you know initially you had other case studies and now you shifted for digital influencers, for example, Nanits as a very, very young um, brand. So I, I would be curious to hear a bit more about, um, about this. Sure. Um, yeah, actually, so when I was uh, thinking, let's say when I was um considering applying for the residency that was in 20 uh, for the fellowship sorry um, that was in 2020 and so um like yeah what happened then I, as we as i talked about and, and uh, shawi also just uh, mentioned so in 2020 in march um or actually it was march april um shanghai fashion week moved online on taobao and so that was something that really kind of it also triggered me and like, hey, this is kind of an interest, it is very interesting and it's something I want to look at. So that kind of um, uh, guided me in kind of thinking about what, well, what do I want to research within my fellowship? Um, I knew I wanted to focus on, on developments in fashion that was already kind of a given, but um, yeah, from what angle or from what uh, perspective? So that 
I mean, I, I remember, I mean, I was, I participated, I looked at all these streams, it was really fun and interesting. And as I said, it was really kind of, there was a level of, of like newness because these designers also nobody had streamed before. So it was kind of funny and people were doing, trying out different things. I don't know if it was so successful, but it was actually quite entertaining as a viewer to kind of just stream in and, and cruise through these different kind of shows and iterations of, of uh, yeah, of, of, of these designers trying different things, let's say. Um, so that's basically where I started. And then actually, I mean, there was a lot of work to be done uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of the research, I mean, I, I as I mentioned, I come from uh, from a background of, of curating and design more broadly, not really focusing very strongly on fashion. Um, so that was also a little bit of a of a stretch. I mean, I needed to really dive in. I needed to go uh, attend Fashion Week and attend all these events, try and 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 create a wider network and and, and reach out to more people and, and interviews and all these things. Um, and so, and yeah, what what you say, I mean during like uh so we had a midterm review i think it was in um in june mm -hmm. and at the time i mean there was a lot yeah it was I, I, I there was a lot of information that i was dealing with um and so uh yeah i was looking at different designers at the time um i had had a long at, at, like, in that period um uh, the, so the beginning of 2021 basically when i started until uh, uh, june um, I had several interviews. One of those include, uh, included the uh, Haurang Lee of Private Policy, um, and actually was also interested in how they um, uh, were establishing their brand. They were actually half based in China and half based in New York, mm -hmm. or at least initially before the pandemic, both designers or two designers were based in New York, and then they uh, moved. Back, one of them moved back, and then the focus also started to shift more on Shanghai. Um, and they work also very much within, like they were able to grow very quickly um, due to collaborations with KOLs, but not only Chinese, actually also a lot of um, uh, American KOLs uh, that they've been able to work with. Um, so I mean, yeah, it, I don't know, it took some time to kind of let all these different influences land and then uh, drive the direction, hey, uh, and, and early on in our discussions, we talked about the approach of the ecosystem which of course has many different factors. Mm -hmm. And so in the beginning, I was really looking at a lot of those different factors, uh, including like, um, let's say an influencer becoming editor of Vogue, uh, which of course happened in the case of Margaret Jang. Um, but it was basically, it was too much. Uh, and then of course, uh, I was doing all this research last year in 2021, where I was, again, things that had started in the pandemic or that the pandemic kind of uh, kicked or it gave a kickstart to, especially uh, in digital, um, uh, moving to the online and digital. Um, so all those things were developing um, uh, a lot in, uh, in basically last year. Um, so then, yeah, you get the emergence of virtual, virtual influencers. Um, NFTs, of course, were huge first in the art field last year and then started to move into design. Um, so yeah, then these things started to seep into, let's say, the presentation or things that I wanted to look at. Um, and then with, I mean, ultimately ending on uh, uh, non-nits as, as, a, as a selected case. Um, I mean, for me, it was also kind of, um, I ended up also having a bit like actually still earlier this year, so pretty late on in my process, having a long, very long uh, interview conversation with him about his like brand development and and, uh, and everything. And he's really like, I mean, he basically started last year. He's in the um, uh, Labelhood Incubator, which means he actually does, he gets a lot of help and support um, and media exposure. And so you see he's already like uh, presenting his work in Vogue editorials, KOLs are wearing his, work, are wearing his uh, collection pieces. Um, and so he's basically, yeah, kind of rising star in this uh, in this program. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, what I what I what it kind of helped, or why I chose it, is is that it ties back into the like back to the history uh, of being based out of Dongguan and actually leveraging um, uh, where all of this started in a different way and looking to the future. Yeah. Thank you. Um... So I just um, saw that there are um, many questions apparently. So um, yeah, Noel is joining us now. Um, and I would say if you're um, both um, fine with this, we would start the Q&A session with the audience. Great, okay, Noel. <laughs> so I'm seeing a few questions coming in now. 
Um, first, can I ask, um, so there's one question. Um, it seems like the local market is rather self-sufficient. So from the perspective of the designers, Anushka, after, ha after having interviewed um, all these young designers, would you think, um, do they have an international aspiration? Not so much um, on the globalization point of view, but also them wanting to have their work known or be assessed on the same platforms as those in the UK or Europe or US, Japan. And also how are these um, digital means that make up the fashion ecology of China influence the fashion um, mechanism outside of China? Um, yeah, I mean, it's true that, uh, let's say the market is really good in China and, the, and due to all of these factors and the very, um, let's say Chinese nature of, of the online sphere in China, um, there is a kind of stronger push inward. Um, that said, I mean, in talking, I did talk to uh, many different young designers um, and what I mentioned also, a lot of them actually uh, studied abroad. So there is a kind of, uh, plus they look like they have interacted in, uh, in, in, in the fashion industry in those, uh, in those spaces, um, in New York, in London, in, in Paris, etc. cetera. Um, so I do see, uh, I do see the desire um, to engage globally um, uh, outside of China. Of course, the pro a problem more recently with this has been the pandemic, uh, which has just uh, made travel very difficult. Um, but uh, yeah, that said, uh, also um, like let's say an increasing number of Chinese uh, designers are actually also showing abroad, um, be it in Paris, be it in Milan, uh, be it in New York. Um, so, it's it's I think it's 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 a little bit double. In part, it's I think there's I think um, what needs to grow, what could grow, or what I hope to to see growing is actually a global recognition of these designers, um, and I think that's important um, because in part showing there was like showing at these fashion weeks is also kind of a link back to the Chinese market. It of course also gives prestige. Uh, and gives, a, a, let's say, a, a enhances or a expands the brand impact. Um, but I think uh, this kind of global recognition is something um, that, that I hope to see in the future, yeah. Um, and then the other, sorry, the second question was about dig uh, the digital aspect. I didn't quite catch that, No, Would you be able to repeat it? Yeah, so um, are, how are these um, digital means that make up the fashion ecology in China influence the fashion model outside of China? Mm -hmm. The fashion model of, sorry? Uh, outside of China. Outside of China, ah, okay. Yeah, um, I think that's a, that's a question to be seen. Um, and I actually, uh, Tanya just now had the question about labelhood and uh, mm -hmm. the model of labelhood, would that translate um, to another context? Um, I think maybe, and I think maybe we need to think outside of, um, outside of what we usually think of, or at least that's me, I, I, and I must say, I mean, I'm, I come from, I'm from the Netherlands, I come from Europe. Um, so that says something about my point of reference, um, if I think about this question. Um, but I think, uh, I think in, in newer emerging economies, and maybe even in, 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 uh, in Europe, who's, who knows, I think definitely there could be space to kind of um, uh, to translate or transfer lessons, uh, like models or lessons learned here. Um, how that transfer would happen, that's, that's yeah, uh, that's also a question. Um, I mean, in the case of labelhood, uh, what has worked or what has made it interesting, uh, or speci specifically when I, when, I, when I was looking at it or what I, what I find interesting about it is the aspect of having um, uh, basically a commerce aspect, a retail, a buyer store, plus the incubator, and that these two kind of work together and, and interact and, and feed each other. I mean, it kind of makes things, vi I mean, um, to incubate brands helps the other part, helps the store, because then you have more, uh, you have more designers, you have more new work, um, uh, you have a wider range that you can sell, that you can sell and you can also kind of adapt um, as uh, certain designers become mature and they can go off on their own and set up their own store, which is happening, for instance, with Shu um, Shu Tong. Um, so, yeah, it is, a, I think it is a potential model that could potentially translate, but the how and the how this transfer takes place, because that the problem is, is really the kind of, yeah, 
the cultural divide, let's say, between China and, 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 and uh, other countries in terms of language, in terms of these platforms, etc. Thank you. Um, there's also another question directed to Anushka about um, your thoughts on whether the emergence of these new production technologies and practices revolving around social ethics would also put designers and brands in the educator's role. And also, if so, are there any systems in place to facilitate and assist these individuals and collectives um, to expand the practice? So the question is more about the the of the transfer or, or about education in that sense, right? Then, of these. Yeah. So, would um, the new production technologies and practices also put a design the designers and the brands in a more educational role? And is there any um, systems that can facilitate such role, the transition of the role? Mm. I mean, the question of education is interesting, I think. Um, uh, and actually, that's something I mean, I'm also interested to see how that develops within China. Um, because also, as I mentioned, a lot of these designers are educated um, uh, overseas and come back. Uh, they do a BA or an MA overseas and then they come back. Um, like a, a small part um, have studied in China, remain, like only studied in China. Um, so I think what or what I hope to see in future is actually that um, also the education uh, sector within the fashion education in China will see some sort of um, a development also as these designers go back into these educational systems, let's say. Um, what's interesting, it were, I, I was um, the case study they had, of course, on non nits. Uh, what I didn't mention is that actually once he returned to China, the first thing he did was to teach um, in, uh, at the China Academy of, uh, of Art in Hangzhou um, and basically taught knitwear uh, to the in the fashion department there. Um, and will likely, even though he's developing his brand now, he will likely at, at, point, at points in his career may return um, uh, for shorter kind of stints uh, or lectures and workshops, et cetera. Um, so I do think, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't like. I haven't seen major, uh, major transformations there as of yet. But I think, um, as the, as like the, 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 the reach and the, and the, as the sector, let's say, of independent design grows, uh, and the creative, creativity factor as well. I think education um, will naturally also have a response. Maybe Xiaowe also want to kind of wants to kind of reflect on this aspect. I think that would be interesting. Also, if we think about maybe even sustainability, because you also mentioned with non nets that you know and then he produces um, um, also pieces that don't create any waste, etc. So I guess there's also a lot of potential if these young designers engage with sustainability. And then we have Xiaowe here, who's an expert. So that would be interesting. Yes. Um, sorry, on which question should I reflect upon? Like there's several ones. Oh, um, and we were talking about um, how the designers could um, also become um, educators, um, teachers. And, and, and if we, you know, if we look at this also from a perspective of sustainability, um, maybe you could give us some input and maybe also tie to the current developments and um, through the lens of from the perspective of sustainability. Since, well, I think, you know, the independent labels are exploding, there are so many, so obviously also sustainability, um, or if they were to be more sustainable, that would have probably a huge impact. Well, I think definitely there's a, a rising awareness of, among young designers, like they all want to be sustainable because like, it's kind of topic everyone is talking about and concerned about, they all want to know what they can do, and so I think I will say the awareness is uh, on average much higher than the average industry, just because they're educated abroad, they're much younger, they are more aware about what's going on, and then they cares about the future and our environment much better. But each of them have different kind of practice. But oftentimes I find it's difficult to discuss like a designer as a, as a whole, because even as independent Chinese designer, even we saw those are in neighborhood or whatever. I mean, there are many different kinds. Some are more commercial than the others, some are more like conceptual, some are more artistic. So it's very hard to say they are all this and that. So, but 
I can all, yeah, I can only say, but maybe I can answer some of you other questions before. It's like number one is, well, I think, again, some of them do have international market because like uh, there are being, if you look at the, all of them, the stock list, uh, quite a few of them, especially those ones you think are good, they all have a kind of, quite a good international stock list, even including the Wall Street market or essence, because uh, they also, because for, a good platform like the Wall Street Market or Essence that they also need to constantly have a new blood. So I think they are welcoming like designers from China and not to mention a lot of the customers are Chinese too. So why wouldn't they welcome some good new Chinese designers? So, so if you are a good Chinese designer, young Chinese designer, they do have like a overseas market, not just the Chinese market. And maybe sometimes it's even more popular than in China. So it all really depends on each of them's style. And it's very hard to say because they're Chinese designers, so they have much wider audience here than, than overseas. Yeah, and if they don't have a strong uh, presence in overseas, that's because maybe their work is not mature enough, but of course they also have to affect it in the past two years because a lot of them, they usually they do shows and, and more importantly, they have showrooms in Europe. So, but now even some of them, they do shows digitally just to keep the presence for branding purpose, but they probably don't, cannot afford to have a showroom there. So that kind of affect their orders a lot. So that's, um, that's kind of explain like uh, where do they sell? And the other questions is about like what production models and something about that. Um, I forgot. Yes. Um, about uh, new production models, um, mm -hmm. does it put um, designers and brands in an educational role? Mm -hmm. A new production model put in uh, educational, uh, like education to whom? That's the part I don't get it. Like education to consumers or like, are they educating the consumer through what they do? Um, I guess it's a question of how would they, how would the um, designers and brands be able to expand the practices outside of um, production um, as kind of like an incubator? Like designer as incubator? Uh, maybe, sorry, maybe can present the question can can and clarify a little bit. Um, that'd be interesting um, to know. Yeah, I think that'd be because I, well, for me, I'm particular as I mentioned a few times, and and I think that's a great opportunity for Chinese designer to grow is to working with the excellent infrastructure of production mode here, either it's traditional or digital or whatever, which is like a, 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 a lot of designers in other places they don't have. Well, maybe they do when you look at like, okay, the, I mean, of course, we hate generation, but it's, you know, so Italian designer always proud of their like a artisanal, like an atelier, a craftsmanship, and, and same as a French one, they have a history, whatever. But I think in China, a lot of people look into that, but it's not there yet. But at the meantime, we probably have the most advanced, like a big manufacturer, which manufacture most of the clothes, except luxury clothes you can see around the world. And especially in terms of technique one. Um, for example, like I think probably you all know Chen Pong right now because after his great start at the Winter Olympic and a lot of those look is he, he co-developed the materials, the, the technology, the style, whatever he collaborated with the manufacturer here. So, so I think that's kind of things I think Chinese designers stand a chance to be much better than the others because they really have a very strong um, production power uh, and very innovative one. And even like a Nanit, when Anushka mentioned about Donggua, I, I find it very interesting because actually I, I visit Donggua many times because they, they probably have the best like a uh, newware factories around there. And the reason I visit there is actually six, well, four or five years ago, I visit a particular factory there because MIT Media Lab has a constant collaboration with them. So, well, so actually Donggua is not just a kind of backwater countryside, they do have the most advanced techniques. Like those things we know by now, like a flyness, whatever, actually it's all developed and invented like maybe 10 years ago from Dongguan. Mm -hmm. I think that answers the, the, the question well enough, I would say. Noel, do we have another question? I think Eco sent a question as well. I saw it popping up. 
Yeah, so Ika asked, um, as Shale, you asked about creativity. Um, as the main communication channel and experience um, shifting to the digital realm, how would the digital aesthetic itself affect um, the actual garment design? And does you know the looks on the screen take up too much? And is this new trend declining the quality and wearability of garments? Uh, I think that's very interesting. I think digital does affect in a lot of word, like uh, in the most obvious sense, because people tend to taking pictures, whatever. So that's why for a while, the design tend to be much more like colorful, easy, like a, what we we'll say like a picture, pictures or, or image friendly. So, so it probably not so much on the constructions and materials for a while, but then, but then that kind of also, so that's probably one way about digital presentations about fashion and change how fashion is being designed. But the other way is more and more people, I think what I'm maybe more interesting, and I think what Anishka was talking about is all this virtual fashions, whatever, but because if we spend more time on a, on a, social, a social space rather than real spaces, actually we probably don't need so many real clothes. And then with you don't need so many clothes and then you probably will can reduce a lot of waste of the material energies go into making manufactured clothes. So that's kind of what arguably can help in terms of the sustainable development of fashions. So, so that's why of course people are saying, well, you create some certain kind of like a virtual fashion, whatever it also has its own carbon footprint. But I guess as long as you don't mint it as NFT and whatever, so it's probably not as bad us really go into like this real manufacturing. So I think that's another aspect I can think about the whole, the, the digital development has to do with the way of fashion is made. But on also the other hand, there's so many like a new way of like technology about how to make fashions and then like a 3D and then whole garments and also like made by orders or like, a, yeah and all different kinds of like a virtual fabric and virtual like a fabrications. So I think all this way is all kind of, I would say on the way to change, to change how fashion is being manufactured and then to be appreciated and consumed. Thank you. Maybe, maybe I quickly would like to respond also to this question because I do think it's interesting. And then I had an example in my presentation. Um, maybe very quickly, I'll show that image. Um, which I think in a way kind of uh, counters that, uh, that assumption, let's say, um, because I think uh, designers could leverage uh, digital imagery in a very new and interesting way. Um, here you can see the instance of Windowsen, uh, which was in my presentation. Um, and so uh, what it looks like is kind of this digital uh, illustration avatar that's then rendered in a, in a, in a really high quality handcrafted couture piece. Um, so I, and that basically that, that counters that assumption. It's very, it's, it, it's hours of work. It's beautifully crafted. It's a totally new aesthetic. Um, uh, and so basically it takes this idea of, of digital or virtual imagery into a whole new realm, I would say. Um, yeah. Well, I think there was also a question from Marisa. So yeah, perhaps um, to wrap up um, the, the, the talk tonight, um, we would love to hear more about um, how Anushka will take your research next. Are there more research or are there any future publications planned? Um, yeah, that is a question. Of course, I, I need to work on a paper and finalize it. Um, that's step one, let's say, of the future of this research. Um, uh, during um, the midterm review, we actually had a, a reviewer uh, present from uh, a university in the Netherlands uh, that does a lot on fashion and, and technolo technology research. Um, and she actually invited me to participate in an in a academic publication uh, with the paper. Um, so that's potentially uh, another area it may go. Personally, actually, um, early on in, 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 the, in the fellowship, I thought about um, actually making a short film or some sort of uh, film format um, uh, based on my research. And I actually ended up, did, I did take a lot of video um, going to all these shows and, and other uh, events. 
Um, so that might, it depends on whether I have extra time to go and do that. Um, and finally, something also that I was thinking about early on is to maybe potentially create an exhibition of sorts um, and based on the research, um, but it will also take me a bit of time to kind of take uh, what I have now as a form of research and then uh, see if it could take on the form of an, of an exhibition, which would be quite different, I'd say, yeah. I think that's a great um, last question. And I mean, we definitely know that the paper in the MPOS magazine is coming. Um, so we're very much looking forward to that. Um, thank you so much, Anushka. Thank you, Shawei, um, as well. Um, thank you um, to the audience. Um, and then um, we'll also have an announcement. Maybe. Yeah, thank you all for joining our talk tonight. And thank you again um, to Anushka and Shalai for, sh for sharing your insights with us. Um, as we end tonight's event, um, I would like to share um, and highlight a few upcoming events organized by M Plus in April. Um, so we'll be um, showing the details on the screen in a second. I'm also excited to announce that um, M Plus and the Science Trust will be co-organizing a symposium in June at the museum. And we'll be gathering all alumni from the M Plus Design Trust Research Fellowship. We'll also be announcing um, opening our call for applications um, for the next iteration of this fellowship um, for research to be conducted in the year 2023. So please um, stay tuned um, on our website and social media platforms um, for future updates. Thank you.